Good morning. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Hey, this has been a full week, uh, weddings, and um, also um, one of our dearest, longest time members, Doris Dixon, uh, went to home to be with the Lord this week. Um, but we've also had full hearts with uh, collaboration going. Got the shirt, finally wearing it. Um, adver- free advertisement. Yeah. I don't know who that was, but that was entirely inappropriate. Uh, and please, please get involved. I am bringing guacamole tomorrow night, and I'm making it. I don't know if you've ever had my guacamole, but there's an, I'll make enough for like four of you, so most of you will still never have my guacamole. But it's pretty good. And anyway, well, tomorrow night, good time. Speaking of guacamole, see that transition? See what I did there? Um, one of my favorite stories, or not my favorite, one of my dad's favorite stories to tell about me, like he has three, I, I mean, you know, it seems like the older you get, you, you kind of fall back into the same few stories and to the point where he's like, story number one, you remember it? Yeah, you, you've told it so many times. And it's like you, he could just have a list and point to the list. And that's anyway, one of his favorite things to tell about me was how much I used to eat when I was a teenager. And I know that's not unusual or whatever. Lots of teenagers eat a lot, but I ate a lot. And you wouldn't tell by looking at me even then or now that I ate a lot, but still, I ate a lot when I was a, a teenager, to the point where um, I, there was this one, fr- there were actually two friends' houses where I would, in middle school, often end up at their houses after school, and both places I was known for eating a lot. And there were a couple of, uh, one, one of the houses in particular, there were a couple of concerns. My, my dad's concern was, son, you don't want to be known as a mooch. You need to reciprocate. And that was a word he used a lot so that it helped me with fractions and things, you know, when school got into that. But, son, you want to reciprocate. You can't just take and take and take. You, you need to give back. You need to do something to, to that. But that, that, was, that was my dad's concern. My, my friend's parents actually instituted rules about food at their house because of me. Like, I didn't know it was okay to have Bluebell on normal days. I thought Bluebell was only for special occasions. But they always had Bluebell in abundance. Or having cereal for a snack. I didn't know that. But it turns out you could have cereal or Pop-Tarts for a snack. And they instituted rules like this, this kid, when he's over here, like keep the doors shut to the pantry. <laughs> and, and so there were these two, so their concern was, is there going to be enough? We want to have breakfast in the morning, but when that friend comes over, uh, we run out of food. <laughs> uh, and, and it continued on um, still to this day. So uh, yeah, lock your pantries if I'm coming over. That's, that's just all you need to know. But those those two concerns are, are helpful for thinking about grace. When we think about grace, when we think about um, how God relates to us, we think about grace mainly in terms of, of God's attitude. But we're looking at Philemon again today and, and think, about, think about it in terms of will there be enough and do we need to reciprocate or are we always in debt? Will there be enough? Do we need to reciprocate? Or are we always in debt? And I'm going to read just the framing of Philemon, okay? Which is fun to say, framing of Philemon. Uh, framing of Philemon. I'll read Philemon verses 1 through 7. It doesn't have a chapter, so you just put 1 through 7. And then picking up in verse 21 to 25, okay? Philemon, verses 1 through 7, and then 21 to 25. Got it? Here's how it goes. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your house. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share For the sake of Christ, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. And then skipping down to verse 21, Paul, after talking about the the issue of Onesimus, this, this slave who belonged to Philemon, which we dealt some of that with some of that last week, 
Verse 21, after Paul's wrapped up his instructions about what he thinks Philemon ought to do, he says, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay? So it's a, that's the frame of this letter. The, the, the big issue in the middle is, is framed by that. And, and here's the big idea. God's gift creates an unstoppable, authentic, generous family. God's gift creates an unstoppable, authentic, generous family. Or to say it another way, which this isn't on your notes, every Sunday is Collaboration Sunday. Let me try that again. Every Sunday is Collaboration Sunday. Amen. Yes, that's it. That's it. God's gift creates an unstoppable, authentic, generous family. Here's the pattern, okay? We receive God's gift and we give. We receive and we give. We receive and we give. God's gift, Jesus himself, is the only prerequisite which sets us up for what follows, okay? God's gift creates a relationship with us. And we as the recipients or the beneficiaries, we make a return on the gift in appropriate ways, not trying to pay him back. We could never pay him back. There's so many examples of this in the ancient world. I, I, I mentioned already, um, I think we're uncomfortable with the idea of, of making a return or God expecting us to make a return on his gift because it sounds like, well, that's not grace if we have to pay him back. And it's, it's not a payback. It's a model from the ancient world that's foreign to us, so it feels weird. We think very much in terms of uh, the Protestant Reformation, that if grace requires anything, then it's not grace, right? Yep. Okay. But the model that would have been so normal in the ancient world was of a, a benefactor and beneficiaries, or a patron and clients, or just in normal terms, the wealthy people doing for others what the others can't do for themselves. If there's going to be in the ancient world around the Roman Empire, if there's going to be a festival, if there's going to be a feast, if there's going to be a, a parade, a citywide thing, and the government can't pay for it, and the poor folk can't pay for it, but the rich, a rich family steps up and donates, and there's a parade, and everybody benefits from it, but they don't keep tabs on everything that's spent and have to pay back the rich family, they start off the parade by saying, hey, the only way this festival happened, the only way this parade happened is because of the generosity of these people. We'd like to thank them. And it's not embarrassing. It's not humiliating or whatever. To, a round of applause. Thank you. It's not an anonymous donor. It is a, a relationship between this wealthy family and the town. Or if the town needs a school or the town needs a, any sort of other building, it was a normal thing in the ancient world for a wealthy benefactor to donate and that to have a relationship with the whole town. Now, of course, things could be taken too far where the wealthy person, you know, has a sense of you owe me now and it can move into a debtor type feel and each case was different, but that was a normal model that everyone in the ancient world around the Roman Empire would have understood. The gift is not anonymous and there's some sort of payback, whether it's thank you, a public thanks, public honor, a plaque that says, hey, this building that we also enjoy was donated by so-and-so. So, -and -so. so don't, don't go around being resentful that so-and-so donated this. I mean, be grateful. Does that make sense? Cities depended on the generosity of wealthy citizens to pay for the stuff that the local people enjoyed. And giving was even seen like, a, it was like a civic duty to the wealthy. And gratitude and the appropriate level of service for the good of, of everyone was seen as kind of the civic duty for those who didn't have money, but they could donate their time 
and they can express their gratitude. These relationships shape the community in a way that's kind of, I mean, it should make sense to us, but talking about grace in those terms might feel uncomfortable because the world has changed since then. So think about this as a model for understanding our relationship with God. The father in the gospel, the father sends the son, the son willingly comes, and Jesus, the son, freely gives himself, welcomes sinners, dies for sinners, conquers sin and death, sits down in heaven, pours out the Holy Spirit. Yes. Jesus is the gift. He's the giver and the gift. Grace is a gift word. More than it is God's attitude, it's first and foremost the actual giving. It is Jesus himself. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. God's grace is himself. It is, it is all that comes with that. We're adopted into his family. That's part of grace, yes, but we get God himself. Reconciliation and justification are just parts of it. And so God's the benefactor, we're the beneficiaries, and we make a return on the gift, not by trying to pay him back, by being good enough or whatever, earning it. No, we make a return by walking in the ways of Jesus. We practice what Jesus taught us and modeled for us about loving God. We obey, we honor, we thank, we love him like the generous giver that he is. Yeah? Okay. And then we practice Jesus' ways by loving others, what he taught and modeled for us. We share God's gift with new people, and that creates new relationships here. In a way, we get to mimic God. We receive God's gift, and we give God's gift. God giving us the gift creates a relationship between us and God, and us passing on the gift to others creates a relationship here. And that relationship doesn't age. It doesn't fade. It always holds. And so we're in relationships with God and with others, and the family expands. This giving and receiving goes on and on. And does God ever run out? No. So the fear of my friend's family that they would run out because I could eat. That's just true. I could eat. When we're dealing with one another, we don't have to worry. Will there be enough? If I, if all that I, if I give all that I have because other people need God's gift from me, will we run out? Will there be enough? There will be enough because Jesus is the gift that never runs out. And the other question that my dad was worried about, are we indebted? Do we, do we have to repay? Are we, do we need to reciprocate? Yes, we need to reciprocate, no. We're not indebted. In fact, if you think about Paul has the exact phrase in one of his other letters, he says, owe nothing to anyone except to love. It's right there. This model of giving and receiving is all over the New Testament. We just haven't seen it because it's based on a, a, a kind of relating that's foreign to us. Think about so many of Jesus's parables only make sense if we're thinking in terms of Giving and receiving creates relationships. They're not equal, but there is a relationship. Think about the, uh, the king who settled debts with his slaves, right? One slave begged and was forgiven so much, and the king didn't expect him to pay him back. I forgave you because you begged me, but I expect you to forgive others, right? The giving and receiving creates vertical relationships and horizontal relationships. Or think about the parables of the talents, right? The wealthy person gives talents, different amounts to different people and expects that you use them in a way that honors the Lord. Or think about the vineyard. Yeah, the parable of the vineyard. All these things. I mean, it's all over the New Testament. We just don't see it. But grace creates a relationship. We receive God's gift and we make a return on that gift, not by trying to pay him back so that he leaves us alone, but we recognize I'm forever in a relationship with my benefactor. And I'm going to make a return on that, not by trying to pay him back, but by following his example and loving others. The gospel creates relationships. Giving and receiving is the normal part and the relationships hold throughout all our lives. 
And so the family of God expands as we receive and we give. We receive and we give. And then we, be, we come to receive from one another as well. That's what, that's what spiritual gifts are. Now look at specifics in the book of Philemon and the book, and not the book, we're not a book yet. Maybe someday somebody will write a book about Allsbury. Can you imagine that? That'd be funny. Um, it'd be hilarious, in fact. So look at some specifics from the book of Philemon and here. First off, in verse 6, Paul, Paul has this prayer that's it's awkward to translate. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective and deepening. It's, it's awkward to translate, and, and I, I was looking at it in the original language. I, I couldn't do any better. <laughs> it's, it's hard to translate, but I, I think this is what's going on. We must pray, which would be both thanking God for what he's given and asking also. We pray for God's inexhaustible gift to become our experience. He's given this inexhaustible gift. God has given us himself, and we pray that that would become our experience, not just our doctrine. I I might paraphrase it. Uh, Paul's praying that your partnership in the faith activates or energizes you toward so much more that God's gift empowers us to do for Christ, for the saints, for the world. Similar ideas come up in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You remember that, that phrase that we like to quote, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard. What has never entered the hearts of of mankind. You know that? We like to talk about that as though it's like heaven. The very next phrase in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, the Holy Spirit was given so that you would know those things. And so similar idea, Paul's saying, there's so much more that God has given to us and put in us, and we need help unpacking that and giving it away. Or in Ephesians chapter one, Paul prays, and, and similarly, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays, um, I want you to know, I'm, I'm asking that God would somehow empower you that you could know all that he has done for you. I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would waken you to understand and just to finally grasp how much, and he names off four dimensions. I don't know if you're familiar with, with how geometry works, but we live in a three-dimensional world, and Paul names off four dimensions to God's love in Ephesians chapter three. I'm praying that you would know all four dimensions of God's love, but you need help just to get it. And so there's so much more that God has done for us in Christ. He gave us a gift that never runs out. And he's saying, I want you to get it. And he's praying that for Philemon in in verse six. I'm praying that the gift that God has given you would become your experience and that you would realize what he has put among us, in us, for others. And we don't have to worry that there's not going to be enough. In Allsbury, we need to pray that the New Testament promises become our experience, not just our doctrine. That was, yeah, that was well-timed. A second thing, a specific thing from Philemon, this giving and receiving, we receive God's gift in relationships. In the specifics of Philemon, uh, there in the middle, the part that I didn't read, Paul talking about Onesimus, this slave that he's sending back to Philemon. Paul says, I gave birth to Onesimus while in prison, in my chains. He's not saying that he sired a child while he was a prisoner. He is saying, I led this guy to the Lord while I was a prisoner. I received the gift, and then Onesimus received the gift from me. And Paul says to Philemon down in, uh, I didn't write it down, verse 19, he tells Philemon, you owe me your very self. You received from me, probably in the sense that Paul's saying, I also gave to you the gift from God and you you were born again because of my sharing with you. I gave to you, you received in relationship. Many others are named in verses one and two, and then at the end, there are, we receive God's gift in relationships. I don't know if you've noticed this from, uh, from scripture, but God does not save people through the message of angels. He saves people through the message of people. Angels say, go talk to so-and-so. The angels show up and terrify people and says, after you change your drawers, 
and um, you know, can see again, go talk to Ananias. Go talk to uh, Peter. Go talk to so-and-so. And the angels are sending people to other humans who are already in God's family, the humans who have received the gift so that they can give it, and then a new bond is formed. The family grows. There's giving and receiving. The gift creates a relationship, but that doesn't create a debt that's one way. We read in Scripture not that Paul's going around saying, I led all these people to Jesus, and you all owe me. Do you see that in Paul? No. He, we see in Paul, a, he calls himself a slave of Christ, and he, he even says, Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. I've received the gift, and it's pretty awful if I keep it to myself. So I, as I freely I've received, freely I give. And it creates relationships, and the body grows. At Alsbury, who here heard the gospel and decided to follow Jesus through the, through the teaching of Scott, through the teaching of Gene, or Tim, or years ago, BJ, or Marty, or your Sunday school teacher? Who, who here uh, came to Jesus because you were invited by a friend or a parent or a guardian or a grandparent prayed for you and shared the gospel with you? Who here came to Jesus because a stranger pointed you toward Jesus? Who here found help, received God's gift of help and nurture in a life group when you were going through hard times or even in a counseling room or from someone who loves you enough to carry you through hard times? Who received from God through another human? Anybody? Did you? I mean, somebody's speaking for you, but I'm assuming most of you did not receive God's gift through angels. It's right and good that we should feel devotion to people who invested in us. God's gift through others to you, to me, forms these relationships. We receive God's gift in relationships. We're not owned by the person who gave to us. We're not indebted to them, but we are connected forever. Not just to pay it forward in some anonymous way, which I, that, I, was, I was worried that we might start thinking about, okay, we've received God's gift, so we need to pay it forward. But that, that phrase often comes with an anonymity that doesn't have a relationship built in it. Like the people who pay for the person behind them in the drive-thru, that's sweet. I'm always gonna be the one who's like, I don't wanna buy somebody else's food. It stops with me, and I know that's gonna put me on social media. Thank you for buying my lunch. I'm just gonna receive it in gratitude. So if I'm in the line, I'm gonna break the line. Just go ahead and figure on that. But it's not the anonymity of paying it forward. It is the personal relationship, family building of I received and I give and now we are forever bound. That's how the church grows. We receive God's gift and relationship. Second, uh, or uh, I guess a third thing. So we need to pray that it would be our experience, what the, the gift from God would be our experience, not just our doctrine. We re- need to receive in relationships. Thirdly, we need to give through relationships. Paul tells Philemon in the the beginning, he says, your faith and love toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints expressed in action has refreshed the hearts of the saints. The saints have benefited from Philemon's, I almost said the phrase, from his receiving and giving. Paul even says, your love, it's translated in the NIV verse uh, 7, your love has given me great joy and encouragement. Paraklesis, if you've heard the word. And it's encouragement, it, it's, sometimes, it's sometimes more than just, I feel good about it. It's, it's even to the point of, I've been challenged by you. Exhortation. Seeing the way that you are, you've received and you're giving, the saints have been built up and they are, they're better. And I even look at it, Paul says, and I'm, man, I want to go further. I want to give more. I'm, a, I'm challenged and encouraged by you, Philemon. Some examples here. We give through relationships. Uh, I just saw this week uh, that Barna Research, from a research study they did in late April, early May last year, found that 70%, 70, that's seven zero, of all U.S. parents are either very or somewhat concerned about 
whether their children will stay in their spiritual faith. 70% are either very or somewhat concerned that their children will stay in their spiritual faith. Now, some of those might not be our faith. This is just the general population. And that seems true to experience, right? Our students walk away from doctrines that they don't have reinforced in relationships. They go to college, they go to the military, they start a job, and the relationships where they were giving and receiving are gone. And if they don't build those new relationships where they give and receive, the doctrines will not hold them in the faith on their own. Those relationships that they had, they need to build new ones of giving and receiving. There is no one who is going to follow Jesus in isolation. Let me give you a percentage there. I'm making this up on the spot. Research shows (laughs) 0% of people who follow Jesus continue to do so when they're disconnected. Because the giving and receiving, we receive the gift, we give the gift, and we receive the gift back, and we give the, and Jesus never stops giving, and so there's always enough, there's always more. Jesus is always multiplying the gift among us, but when we disconnect whether it's going off to school or going off to the military or starting a job or just moving away from mom and dad because I've had enough of that. Whatever it is, you disconnect, you're not going to survive. And it's not that you don't know the truth, it's that the way that God gives the gift to us is in giving and receiving with others. So you're not going to keep the faith disconnected from church. You say, well, I don't like the institutional church. Well, sorry, make it better. But don't don't walk away from it. So you could, here at Allsbury, if you've received the gift, it's time to give the gift. You can get involved in preschool. Well, that's not my shape. That's not my whatever. God hasn't given, gifted me to work with kids. Well, awesome. Love someone and invest in someone that God has gifted to work with kids. Take care of the adults who are taking care of the kids. Or lab or Spark, or the Allsbury Teen Ministry. My life group has been working up very slowly to care for the two volunteers that helped him. And maybe sometime before 2025, we'll actually do something for him. As you have received, so you should give. Then there are kingdom kids, forever friends. If you have received the gift from the Lord, it seems like membership should mean, it, membership at Allsbury should mean not that you're here or online at this certain point, but you are committed to giving and receiving with these people. That's what membership should mean. And if you're going to receive only, maybe we should set a separate category for that of not member, because the word member comes from, oh, it even comes from the New Testament writings, members of the body. The body builds itself up when every member is doing its part. Think about all the scriptures say about how the body of Christ works. If you are a member on paper, but not a member in giving and receiving, then you're not a member. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying we're purging the roles, but if you're not in the relationships giving and receiving, then what are you doing? We need to pray that the gift And all that it entails, like Paul prayed, becomes our experience, not just our doctrine. We need to receive in relationships. We need to give in relationships. Fourthly, we need to face the real details. Philemon is written to face the real details of how hard it's going to be to give and receive when a slave comes back to his master. The, The letter is like a conversation from a distance. Paul's setting up this conversation where Paul and Timothy or sending Onesimus back to this church that meets in Philemon's house, or maybe Apphia's house, or maybe uh, Aristarchus' house, it's hard to say, or Archippus. I'm pulling out the wrong names. And so there's this conversation happening by this letter that's going to be read out loud, and then there's the church there. 
And so here's this conversation. The church has this huge part to play as Onesimus is there with Paul's letter. And Philemon has to decide, what am I going to do now? And here's the church as they watch. And so they have to affirm Onesimus is now our brother. He was a slave, and we treated him like he was inferior to us. But in Christ, he's not. And so we have to, it's going to be, it's going to be weird. I can imagine the, the church that met in Philemon's house saying, this is going to be weird for a while. Let's just go ahead and admit, it's going to be weird. We used to tell you what to do and then sit around and watch you do it. But now we're in a giving and receiving relationship where we're equals. So let's face the details. Here at Alsbury, let's just admit that we're not great in all aspects of the giving and receiving. I'll not go into more details on that. I have a little paragraph I wrote here in my notes. Um, but let's just say we're going to face the details and not be afraid of them. Can we do that? Like four of you can. This is going to be really awkward. So one of the details is <laughs> that most of you don't want to face the details. <laughs> we're going to face the real, de real details because we're in a relationship. Not just because you're sitting in a building and I'm wasting your time talking for a really long time as I look at the clock. We're going to face the real details. Humility. Humility allows us to start toward authenticity. We want to be an authentic family. And gentleness allows us to stay in the authentic area. Receiving the gift as the Holy Spirit works in us and giving ourselves to one another. I don't know if you've picked that up yet. I haven't actually said that phrase. But if we receive the gift and then we give and we receive and we give, then we actually become the gift ourselves. It's not that we forward on the resources to somebody else. The only way the relationship works is Jesus empowers me, the Holy Spirit fills me, and I give myself. I make myself available to you, and I serve, and I love you. And then you receive that. You receive Jesus in me. You receive uh, the gift of God from me, and you love and serve me back. And there's, there's reciprocation to make my dad happy. So that was four. We face the real details. Fifth is we build relationships of giving and receiving for seasons and for generations. And Philemon, we don't know, we actually don't know, and I don't know if, if I said this last week, but I learned this week that we don't know that Onesimus was a runaway slave. We know that he was a slave and that Paul was sending him back to his master, but the letter doesn't actually say that he had run away. That was just a, a theory in, in some, of, some of church history that has stuck. But it might be that Onesimus was actually sent to Paul from Philemon as Philemon's official representative. And Paul says, okay, I led him to Jesus. I appreciate the help, but I want to send, you, send him back so you can work through this new relationship. The relationship has changed. So it could be that there was no runaway situation at all. But Paul says, perhaps... That's why he was separated from you for a while so that you could receive him back forever and there would be this permanent relationship, not just the short term of you own him until he dies or until someone pays his, for his release, but you are permanently connected now as brothers in Christ. The church's part was to send Onesimus back as well and to pray for Paul's release and even to prepare a guest house for our guest quarters probably just a closet. It probably wasn't a guest house. I don't know. But there's this, there's this temporary seasonal thing, and then there's the lifetime thing. At Allsbury, we, want, we need to pray, send, and go. That would have been a well-timed thing for someone on the missions committee. Pray, send, go. Yes. Amen. Whatever. So, I said a couple of months ago, I think three years at Allsbury should be enough time for someone to embody our values. For that to work, it's not going to be three years of listening to sermons. That ain't going to change anybody. Everyone 
here who is a member receiving from Jesus through Allsbury can make a return on that relationship by investing in others connected here. It's time for membership to mean personal receiving from others, personal giving to others. And then the vision of a three-year stay here changes somebody, works. Not because I'm amazing or Brock's amazing or Gene or Tim or Paige or Susan, although they all are, or Sherry. Hi, Sherry. It's not because we have an amazing staff. It's not because we have an amazing building. The vision works as the gift becomes effective, like Paul prayed for Philemon. I pray that your partnership in the faith may become effective, awakening, actualizing, empowering for all that is in us for the sake of Christ. Three years could do that. We receive, we give. We develop family relationships because we're already in Jesus' family. We struggle through the hard times. We, we let one another in our mess and membership means that I'm invested in investing in you. And you're invested in investing in me. And that could mean that the more permanent population, folks who are going to live around here for a long time, look for ways to give and receive that build relationships that go beyond the easy, the obvious, and the preferred. But we see God has put me here so that we can invest in, in people who might not be here for very long, but just for a season. We commit to make disciples through a network of relationships. And some of them stay, and many of them go. And they go on, and the giving and the receiving builds new families, new relationships around the world. We have some of those here this week. You, say, you might say, well, I don't have time to do stuff. Come eat with us tomorrow night. I mean, really, clear your schedule and come eat with us tomorrow night. You say, well, I don't know that that's actually giving and receiving. It is. It is. Have the conversation. And build this relationship that lasts forever. As you've received, you give. Let's pray. Lord, you started this. You gave us Jesus. We heard about Jesus through other saints who shared the gospel with us. We want and we need to make a return. We know that you bought us and you brought us into your family. Today, we confess that many of us have not developed the relationships of giving and receiving. Some of us connected with Allsbury receive your gift, but don't give to others. Many of us are choosy. We only receive from certain people and we only give to certain people. People that we identify with by stage in life or by age or by education or by social status or even by denomination if we go outside uh, just the Allsbury thing. God, forgive us for being choosy about which ones of your children we'll receive from or give to. Some of us give but don't ask to receive for, for any number of reasons. Pride, don't want to admit that we need, or a lack of self-awareness, we're not even aware that we need, or maybe shame to ask, or modesty, a, a false modesty. Holy, Holy Spirit, please guide us, guide the staff, guide the deacons, guide the ministry leaders, guide the life group leaders, and all our volunteers to develop giving and receiving into all of our programs and schedules so that things only work if we are receiving your gift and passing it on. Show up in power when we do our routine stuff so that we actually minister you to one another. Please empower every member to build up the whole body in love.
Okay, church, did you hear that call?